Hello, welcome to Digital Tabletop Fest, the Blood and Dice panel. In this panel, we are going to talk about the randomness of conflict and the randomness that uh, and how conflict and randomness get used in games and how they maybe work together and maybe times that they don't. Uh, and we've got together an amazing panel of people to talk about it, representing some truly fantastic projects. So without further ado, I'm just going to dive in and uh, ask each of our fantastic panelists to introduce themselves and what project they're about. So um, turning to yourself first, uh, Lynn, um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and the project you're here, to, or projects in your case, you're here to represent? Hello, my name is Lynn Hardy and I'm the Associate Editor for Call of Cthulhu at Chaosium and I'm also the Line Editor for Rivers of London, the role-playing game, and that's what I'm representing today. Fantastic, and congratulations on Regency Cthulhu, by the way, it's pretty cool. Thank you. Um, right, and then if, if I could turn next, uh, if I could turn next to um, Cormaca, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you're working on? Of course, I'm a voice actor and content creator and working with Hooded Horse together on a multitude of games. Recently, you might know um, Against the Storm or Terra Invicta. Yeah, I did Terra Invicta. I backed on Kickstarter actually back in the day, which was a very <laughs> good Kickstarter backing. Uh, and then I'll turn to Patrick. Uh, welcome. Uh, great to have you here. And do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what project you were on? Yeah, my name is Patrick Belanger. I am a programmer on the World Walker Games team working on the game Wildermyth. And that's it. Well, more than that's it. Wildermyth is a fantastic game. I'm sure you, every, everybody I mentioned the game to and that you were going to hear is like, I love Wildermyth. So that's fantastic. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, Dan, uh, could you. you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so I'm Dan Maskell. Uh, I'm production lead at um, publisher Curve Games. I'm really fascinated by games of skill and chance. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I'm currently working with iNote Games in Vancouver as uh, developers uh, on For the King 2 uh, to release later this year. Exciting. I was very pleased to see uh, that For the King 2 is coming out because For the King is a great game. Uh, and just to introduce myself as I charged in to introduce you all. So I'm Thomas Rawlings and I'm the studio director of Auroc Digital. Uh, I've worked on a number of games, including Randomness. Uh, which I'm sure we'll touch on as we go. So let's dive into the start of it. Uh, and in, in preparation of this panel, I was looking up like how old is like Games of Chance and I suspect kind of way into prehistory before we have records of it. But the earliest one we've got something of it is a, a game called Senet, which is like a, an ancient Egyptian game. And they had these kind of flat two-sided throw sticks that, that indicated the number of squares a player could move like really early dice. The earliest like dicey thing that we could really call a dice is from a, a backgammon-like game, uh, and that comes from approximately two and a half thousand year BCE, so you know, a good three thousand years plus ago, uh, uh, more than that, four five thousand years ago. And again, I suspect the stuff going there. So, given we've been making games with randomness in for so long, you know, why why do you think we're so attracted to randomness? Like, what what is it we as people playing and making games get out of randomness and um, Lynn, you know, as, as somebody working on role-playing games, obviously you think of dice and role-playing games in the same thing. Would you, would you, you know, have any thoughts on that initially? I think we like surprises. You know, dice give you surprises, let's face it. You know, you, you never quite know, unless you've got loaded dice, of course, which is naughty. But it, there is that wonderful element of when you pick that those dice up and you roll them, Everyone leans in to see what's going to happen. They hold their breath. And I think that's something that we love, that anticipation, that level of we don't know what's going to happen. We really don't have any control over this. It's thrilling. It's exciting. It's also nerve wracking. And human yes. brains are weird. And we like that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, no, I can completely see that. Um, Patrick, you know, Wildermyth, definitely feels to me like a game where randomness is playing a big role in what happens, like a, an outsized role. And again, with that slightly TTRPG feel about it, I mean, from, you know, working from the other side of it, what can you tell us about how you all see randomness as part of that game? Yeah, I think randomness has a lot of different roles in Wildermyth, but um, one of the main ones about just like for any uh, tactical strategy game is that it sort of takes pressure off of the need to be perfect. Randomness makes it so that 
you winning or losing while you have a lot of influence over it a lot of the times is not nece- like it's not necessarily your fault if you miss a shot because it's randomness or so it it provides like Lynn said it provides that excitement um but it also takes a little bit of the pressure off um and it encourages trying out a lot of different builds you you're produced you're given random options sometimes and you need to work with what you have and it encourages exploration of the game yeah and 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 dan you know in the work on uh, you know for the king again has that very strong ttpr uh, rpg vibe about it uh you know from your from your view of the game like why why do you think why are you using randomness you know in it or are you is that i'm misinterpreting how it goes like how's randomness going in there well I sort of, I'd like to sort of step back a bit, really, and just mm. say, you know, that life is random. Um, you know, we have to accept in the real world quite soon that, you know, you could play the best cards that you have in the best possible order, uh, but the outcome could always could be a disaster, or it could be a triumph. It's not always in our in our hands, and I think that can be reflected in in games. Uh, you know, the jeopardy, the risk, and the danger. It's it's exciting, uh, and you've got to say what's what's the possible what's um, the point of uh, the possibility of losing if, if there wasn't anything to gain. You know, randomness brings a life, a uh, game to life, I think. Uh, uh, anything could happen. And, uh, yeah, no, that's a good point. And just digging into that a little bit more then, you know, when you think about, and again, I, I think it's good taking a step back from it, abstracted, do you find yourself attracted to games that are highly random? You know, what, what, what sort of game do you personally enjoy that have, a, you know, what degree of randomness do you enjoy in games? Um, I think um, it's coming down to that sense of the, the sense of control, really. And I think um, I think if any point that the player feels cheated, that's really a, a bit of a, a sign of a bad game design to me. I think um, the closer you can get to that line, the better, really. Uh, just having enough control. Um, put back to the to the to the player. Um, it's ultimately, what it comes down to: how much control do you have over your over your own actions and and your own behaviour? Yeah. And and then finally, turning to you, just on this this broader topic of randomness in games, um, Cormaker, how do you yeah how do you see randomness in games? What what sort of level of it do you enjoy? I think the m- more in depth it goes, the more intriguing it becomes because it's kind of playing direct the direction of it but then these random factors are like throwing back at you all kinds of random situations that you have to quickly respond to and i think that makes it kind of uh from a gameplay perspective replayable and intriguing even if you play the same scenario again because of the randomness factor and like turning around assets or like another enemy popping up or something like that this makes it intriguing and kind of keeps you in, in, in the juice, wants to, to keep you on forward. And especially when we said dice rolling, it's kind of this, yeah, I can say it again, this lean in, will the dice make it? Will be able to unknow, unlock this door? Or are we blocked at this door and have to deal with the situation and find another path uh, to moving forward? And, and I think that's that's what's making it so exciting. And that's why we're kind of nearly addicted, I would say, <laughs> to this kind of mechanics because it's, yeah, just fun. Lynn. Yeah, can I just add Lynn, to that? You want to dive it's, in. it's the sort of like randomness should be a tool to include or, or to generate creativity on your player's part and on the GM keeper's part or, you know, however in a game. It shouldn't be there to stifle, as Dan said. You know, it's the whole thing is that we're here to enjoy and create and have fun. Um, so you need as much randomness that's going to support that. And as Dan mentioned, you've got to find that very fine line where it's going to tip over into frustration because once you've gone over that line, you know. Brilliant. Uh, well, Marlo, thank you for joining us. Um, Hi. Uh, yeah, glad to have you here finally. Um, we, we've all done a quick round of intros, but if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and, and you know what, what, what games you're representing here, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll catch you up on the conversation. Sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Marlo Doby. I am a game developer and artist and art director uh, for a bunch of indie games, but today I'm representing uh, Dicey Dungeons and Floppy Nights. 
welcome that's great we were discussing like randomness as a as a thing that humans are attracted to in games uh and and yeah uh, lynn was just giving us a, a great kind of additional kind of point in how we see randomness so for you just step back as a kind of looking at games as a broader thing you know how, how do you see randomness in games i think that besides the obvious kind of concept of replayability uh i think that games randomness really kind of gives you that opportunity as a player to like feel like you get to do sort of like resource management and feel really smart and just like it's like that idea of as a player being able to adapt in a really fun way um that i think for me as somebody who plays a lot of like deck builders and tactics games and everything like that it makes me feel like i have that good math moment where i'm just like oh i got to feel very smart and i think that's why i appreciate randomness is that you kind of have that opportunity to adapt and have a little bit of extra fun with your games okay um well digging into that a little more because i, I think for for me if i if i in my head when you know looking at this and i thought what's the least random game uh, i could think of and i'm having somebody it's probably chess like it, it's probably the least and like what what's the most random game it's got to be one of the the kind of gambling games like you know um pontoon or 21 i don't know call it or snake eyes like die, die space games lynn you, you're gonna get, there's an even more random one than that is it well i mean it, it, it is very random <laughs> i played it the other weekend it's something called perudo which is effectively in a version of liar's dice which is great because it's you know you're you're betting how many dice have a certain are showing a certain number and i mean it's totally random okay if you're really clever you could figure out the, the probabilities of what everybody's got and of course every time somebody gets one wrong and gets knocked out a dice is removed so you know you're you're betting how many dice have a number a particular number and if someone challenges you you're wrong out you go and a dice is removed and and that it's incredibly random but very fun because everybody again is doing that whole leaning forward thing and like holding their breath and going how far can i push this before somebody challenges me and you know i'm out of the game yeah so yeah i mean it's kind of interesting because it's like i i think for me as a you know as a game designer one of the things i think of is and i think it's been alluded to a couple of times in the discussion to what degree is it good to give the player some control of that randomness? Like what, what tools or what, what design tricks? Uh, and again, I, I, you know, uh, you know, the, the we, we, we did a port of Ogre with uh, Steve Jackson games, Ogre and like Ogre, you know, we, we still had the dice rolling in and it's core. It, it ha it's basically a system of, you know, when you attack something, you roll the dice, you need a high score on the dice to take that thing out a low score. You don't. But the big thing you have the ability to control is you can combine attacks. So if one of your units has got like a five, six chance of destroying that evil tank, if you put two of your units together, they've got a four, five, six, you put three of them together, they will definitely destroy it. So, and that, that to me is one, one of the great things about the game. It's really simple to understand. The more you combine stuff, the higher the probability you've got. So in, in Ogre, that, that is a great example. So I wonder in the projects that, you know, uh, projects that you know, or even other games that you thought, where, where you saw like the ability of the player to go and I'm struck by what you said initially, Lynn, in, you know, randomness is surprise. It's that, you know, we just don't exactly know what's going to happen. But as I think a couple of other people said, and I think he says, well, is if, if the player feels the randomness is unfair, then they get annoyed at it. But if they feel control, so um, yes, starting with, with you then, Dan, as you, you've given some interesting thoughts about randomness overall of life, you know, yeah. where, where do you feel we start to get control of randomness in games? Yeah, I think um, I think the the control in in these type of games comes from usually like a resource, um, whether that that's uh, like re rolls or or like guaranteed success of a, of a roll. Um, and for the king, that that's that's called focus. So you can you can essentially guarantee that you're going to have a successful dice roll. Um, but a game that I play uh, competitively and quite avidly is uh, is, is Blood Bowl. Um, it's uh, it's like um, a tabletop uh, miniatures game, like as a parody of American football. But in that game, you have the resource of rerolls, uh, and it's the craziest love hate relationship with RNG you've ever, you, you could ever dream of. Um, <laughs> but you're, you're in control of these uh, rerolls essentially. Uh, and it's a game of risk management, so everything you're doing is trying to do the least risky things first, moving towards the riskiest 
components of the game. And if you absolutely have to use a reroll, um, and that's your sense of control. But the problem comes actually down is actually to the person, right? Because I think people are terrible judges of probability because we get emotional uh, and your brain becomes instinctual. And I found with myself, and I think it's quite common that you just chase, you particularly chase a losing situation. Like if you're behind, I was in a tournament or yesterday, or no, sorry, Saturday, um, 70 players, first game, first few moves, and I completely blew it. I, I got so excited, I was in a tournament, and I wasted all my rerolls within the first two turns of 16, and my game was pretty much downhill. I lost 3 0. And that's because I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't know when to stop. I should have just stopped. Um, and for me, uh, putting a sense of control on it is about putting brackets on these probabilities. So I put them into categories, like the techniques, you know, to get more sense of control. Um, something, this is likely, this is less likely, this is unlikely, very unlikely. That helps me deal with my emotions because I'm like, okay, I knew that was very unlikely. Don't worry about it. Um, second technique is actually breathing. <laughs> breathing techniques <laughs> to calm myself down uh, and just reconnect my thinking part of my brain. And, and yeah, that's that's how I get that control in these uh, these games. And I don't, you know, rage quit is uh, is a is a thing with that's RNG it. for sure. <laughs> well, that's, that's great. Some good, good, good tactics there. Um, Patrick, with the players of, of Wildermyth, you know, you, you said, you know, you talked a bit about how you saw the randomness in it. You know, how, how do you feel they have a sense of control with what you've built or don't they? Like, do they, is it, is it illusory that they feel they have control? <laughs> uh, a little of both. So certainly in combat, we try to give players a decent amount of control, uh, our main way to mitigate randomness is flanking. So anytime uh, you you first attack an enemy, and then if you make another attack from 90 degrees or more from that attack, then you have a 100% chance to hit that enemy. So that's the main thing of uh, making it so that you can get guaranteed hits, which when I'm playing Wildermyth, I basically always expect that my first attack against an enemy will miss, even if it's 95% chance. Um, we certainly get plenty of comments of players asking about the randomness in Wildermyth because they're like, oh, I missed four 90% shots in a row. Is this, is the randomness wrong? Which it's not. We're pretty dang sure it's not. Uh, humans are just very bad with probability. Um, yeah. but it is funny. We, we are much more likely to look at bad outcomes that happen many times in a row and be like, something's wrong then to see multiple good outcomes and be like, oh, that's really good. Hmm. Um, but so in Wildermyth, we also, there are several things that we try to keep a little bit more random. So for example, most of the events in Wildermyth are picked randomly in a way that you can't control super easily. There are a lot of players who, when they want a certain thing, they will try to finagle it to work in their favor in that way. But we... We like keeping at least some of it random in a way that's not as easily maneuvered around to keep that air of mystery and exploration. Uh, that makes sense. I just well, I'll come to you, Marlo, in a moment if, if, with the same sort of point, picking up on on how how you know how you give control in the games you've made. Um, sure. But I do want to ask, as we've got a bunch of game de video game developers, and and I don't know whether there's insight you have, Lynn, is when you mentioned Patrick, like players asking you, like, I, I've worked on several games with like random number stuff like role-playing games and tactical games that have numbers in it and I, we have had exactly the same question multiple times to the point where i you know got it the game to spit out numbers into a text file and then just put that into a spreadsheet and summed it to just prove it really was random but i'm interested is any, anyone else uh, had the same thing where people are going are you sure this is random oh yeah 100 <laughs> <laughs> percent right I it's, it's so also... much. I think what people don't know is it's so much harder to program not randomness than it is to just program <laughs> randomness. They assume yeah. we put all this work into it, but we didn't. <laughs> but Lynn, you, you look like you're, even though you're not a video, on the video game side and stuff. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, the whole thing is, though, if you're rolling dice and they're not random, you can curse your dice, you can blame them, you know. You can even <laughs> stick them in a dice jail that someone bought me because my dice were rolling appallingly <laughs> during the whole campaign. Um, but obviously with a computer game, you don't see that. You have You don't have that tactile connection to the complete lack of randomness and not getting that probability is awful and will always screw you in the end um so yeah you know it's it's just it's really interesting to hear that because yeah we don't tend to hear that from the role-playing side of things the, the ttrpg side of things but yes i imagine you must get it all the time about you program yeah. this so that we can't succeed yeah no absolutely and uh yeah core, core maker if i come to you then um you know what 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 What's the control in, in projects like Against the Storm and Terran Vitica? What's the control of randomness you think the player feels they have there, if they do, again, if, unless it's illusory? I mean, in, in Terran Victor, they have often it very plain and simple depicted in percentage if the how high, how high the chances for their success doing something. For example, one of your agents is has a background being uh, a criminal, and then this criminal agenda catches up with him and you have to deal with his past and he's like uh well i want you to hack me uh xyz and uh you have to decide if you let him do that or not and then we'll spit out a percentage how likely it will be uh there to happen so it's kind of like an yeah a little bit of an illusionary control there in terms of like uh if you will succeed or not and in against the storm it's even a Further and broader in terms of um, a roguelike uh, mechanic with uh, cards that you get depending on what kind of next buildings you unlock while you build your, your homestead. So you have a direction of three paths and a reroll to reroll those three again uh, on the first one for free and the second one will cost you resources. So there is kind of a illusion there that you are in control in which direction this whole thing is going but mainly it's quite often random that i want to do what you will unlock and uh if you manage as a player to design all the paths and interconnect them the right way we'll win if not we'll lose <laughs> brilliant i'm um, coming to you marlo sorry i was going to jump to you next but the, the whole the whole us all realizing we all had the same thing that people made yeah. us about <laughs> derailed me a little um but yeah uh, yeah tell us a bit about uh, you know how you're giving the player control of randomness yeah um, sure i think that it's the way i see it in my mind is there's like a way to you can let your player control randomness or you can let your player mitigate the effects of the randomness if that makes sense i think in something like floppy nights the randomness comes a lot in just like the fact that you're drawing cards from a deck and you know you're gonna have a random hand and you can kind of control what that random hand is by building your deck obviously so you could say like i really want to draw more of this i want to draw less of this i want to see more of this i want to see less of that so you do have control in that way and i think something that's great about that game too is that we sort of also added this mitigation of randomness where you every unit on your map because it's a tactical top-down tactical game has a free attack action they can take regardless of what hand you draw so the player will feel like they are able to do something every turn despite the randomness even if you draw the worst hand you will very likely still have an action that you can take i think looking at something like dicey dungeons which has historically had a lot of that is this game really random uh, question pop up when yes, it is. Um, I think that there is obviously ways you can control the randomness, like the first characters you play, you can reroll a lot of the time. There are equipment that pops up throughout the game that let you sort of like adjust your dice rolls, like bump them up or down. But I think the like galaxy brain kind of way to play that game, if you, once you get into the hard stuff is about mitigating randomness much more than it's about controlling your random outcomes mm -hmm. and i think about like characters like the witch or something are quite hard to play comparatively but it's really about just like i don't want to make something that's going to hit the hardest i want to make something that's going to make sure i don't die if i roll a six and i really don't want to roll a six so mm -hmm. it's kind of you kind of have to like change your mindset based on the character you play in a game like that if it's about controlling or mitigating um, but yeah, I, I just find that really interesting, that whole concept mm. of like how you let the player control it or react to it. No, de definitely. 
And then, then Lynn, turning to you, you know, we, we've as video game developers, we in theory could fix the dice, which we definitely don't. Um, <laughs> but you know, what, what tools do you have, you know, as a as a tabletop RPG creator to give the player some sense of control over the randomness? Well, I mean, the first thing is, you know, don't just roll dice for everything. Um, because that's just introducing a degree of randomness that you probably have no control over. Um, really, you know, the best time to roll dice is when it's going to mean something in terms of the direction of the story. You know, again, it's that whole leaning. Is everybody going to lean forward and hold their breath waiting to see what the outcome is? Is it going to take the story in an interesting direction if you get someone to roll these dice and they succeed? But is it also going to do the same if it fails? Um, so that's the first thing is, you know, don't overuse your dice. The second thing that we have in, in both Call of Cthulhu and Rivers of London, obviously we have um, pushing roles. So, you know, if mm -hmm. your initial role fails, as long as you can convince the GM that you can do something extra to really put that extra effort in, you can have another reroll. And then my personal favourite, which I've kind of pushed to the fore in Rivers of London, is the look spending mechanic, which I adore because it's, it's great fun watching the players trying to work out how much to spend when in a scenario. But it's also that great thing. It it's it's sort of like it helps them feel like they're cheating fate and evil dice. You know, like oh, I missed that roll by one. I'm going to spend a point of luck, and then hey, it's a success, and we can keep doing what we were doing. Could you give an example? Because that sounds really intriguing. Could you give an example of from a game that you know play test or or you know something that's happened where that's played out? Like how would a player make a decision? Because it sounds like a scarce resource that they can't just throw around. Well, it depends. I mean, a lot of the games I run these days are at conventions. So, you know, they're pre-generated characters for speed and accessibility, and they have a set number of look points. And of course, it's all bets off in a, in a single session convention game. So you encourage players to just sort of like spend them, you know, however they want, willy nilly. Um, but there's always that consequence if they do that early, they may not have them when they really need them at the end. I'm a softie. I always do say, you know, it might not be worth you spending a look on this particular role or, oh, heck no, you really need to spend luck on this one. And, it, you know, at the end of a game, it has, you know, literally been the difference between life and death in combat situations when they've come, you know, duking it out with a big bad um, that, you know, some people have had enough luck left to sort of save themselves from appalling combat roles. Um, and other people have died ingloriously. Uh, so, you know, it, it can it can add that extra fantastic level of, oh, what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah. No, that's cool. Um, okay, well, what I want to do now, we, we've, I mean, we have talked a lot about the projects as well, but it'd be good to kind of get a focus on, you know, uh, how, how you're using, like, how you're, you know, this combination of the randomness and the control of randomness how those two things come together, uh, plus any other factors that you feel is, is of interest to know in each of the, the individual projects that you're on or, or you know, other projects that kind of spring to mind as part of that. Um, and so uh, starting with, with you this time, Patrick, you know, when, when you bring all these these thoughts together, these strands together, because World of Myth, you know, it has that fantastic roguelike element where the, it tells a story. And, and it's interesting when, you know, I play it and talk to other people playing it, like, they talk a lot about how that story played out, but obviously for that to work, there has to be randomness to it. If everybody's story played out the same, it wouldn't be very roguelike. It would just be a single player game. Um, but yeah, how, how do you bring all those things together in Wildermyth? Right, yeah. So uh, event and hero randomness. So like Wildermyth is very much a game about having a party of heroes and discovering who there are. Who, who they are, discovering their personalities and um, the things that are happening to them. So, uh, like, we want each run to be different. Um, we start out with a cast of heroes with randomized personalities. We let you adjust those personalities because we also want players to be able to, again, mitigate that randomness. If, if you want to make your best friend in Wildermyth, you can adjust those uh, personality traits up and down. But all of the events that happen in Wildermyth are based off of both character personalities. So whether you have a bookish hero or a snarky hero or someone who's a romantic um, and also things that have happened to those heroes. So for example, you might have a hero encounter 
a shrine that turns them into a wolf hero. And then you might have an event later on that only happens if you have a wolf hero in your party. So we have a lot of a lot of these things where one event will lead to another outcome later on down the line. And it creates this great feeling of discovering who each hero is and discovering like sometimes their backstories come up through events as well and various other things. Um, in addition to that, even beyond the, the story and event side of things, we try to do, we, we feel similarly about uh, the gear that the heroes pick up and the abilities that they get. So uh, that's why those are random. Like we want you to try out different builds mechanically. So you get three random abilities on each level up and we do have a reroll. So if, if you have a very specific ability you want, you can use that. But we want players to try making heroes that are different from ones they've made in the past. And items, so this is a slightly controversial for some players, but we have no inventory management in Wildermyth. And that is a very intentional choice. When you get an item, mm. when you get a giant hammer, we want that item to only be on that hero. So that hero holds the item permanently until they replace it. They can't hand it off to another hero. And that uh, makes that item be a part of who that character is. You think of this character as the character with the big hammer. You don't just think of it as, oh, this is a character and they don't have a specific weapon because I swap around my best weapon to whatever hero needs it at any given time. Uh, yeah. No, that's a, that's, a, that's a great, that's a great, yeah, and that's a great example there of kind of pulling all those threads together and saying, um, Coming back to you then, Marlo, um, again, you know, similarly from Dicey Dungeons and, and um, uh, you know, I mean, I've played Dicey Dungeons quite a lot. And for me, like that ability to place the dice where you're going, like it's that ultimate thing, but with the randomness. Uh, I picked up Floppy Nights recently and it's on my two playlists. So I'm looking forward to coming to that. So uh, I'd be intrigued to uh, know on, um, yeah, how, how all those work for you. You know, how all yeah. this stuff comes together to make that work. Yeah, I think that, in a lot of ways it coalesces in sort of a similar way that Patrick just spoke about, just the idea of uh, encouraging players to play differently than they might normally. Um, I think that the randomness in those games really comes up in, for lack of a better term, like preventing character or preventing players from just like playing the same build every time from just trying to like, min max this one strategy to death and i think for players myself included as a player sometimes need that little like spice of life thrown in to realize oh maybe the thing i was doing wasn't the best thing to like get through you know this hard roguelike level that i'm trying to beat so i think I, I think especially about dicey dungeons that you know you get a lot of randomness in the equipment that you find throughout your runs, especially based on like what character you're playing and what level you're playing. And it does come from, you know, a relatively small pool, but you are going to get a random selection of things. And, you know, you're just not going to be able to do the same build that you want every time. If you think I'm doing this like thief build and I always want to get this one specific piece of equipment, likelihood is you're not going to run like run into it so it does make you have to like do that sort of adaptation math in your head that I personally feel is like a really good thing to feel when you pull that off in a game and I think the randomness that we use just really pushes players to be better players at the game but also to kind of just like get that fun payoff a lot of the times yeah no, no that's, that's a great summary thank you um, Core maker, then Terra and Vitica, because Terra and Vitica, like to me, playing it, it feels like you say, like it, the, it's this big grand story, and like the small percentages of things like happen, feel like they get absorbed into the big grand story, um, and you know, and it feels to me, it feels like simultaneously a world. I do feel I have control because I've got lots of stuff I can do. But also, there's bigger forces at play that are larger than you know, and I don't know what they're all doing. Uh, for anyone who's not played it, you know, in fact, you're probably worth you, um, yeah, sort of saying a little bit about the game and, and what it is as part of that. 
So Terran Mikta is a great strategy game where you touch down with alien contact for the first time. It's playing in uh, 2022, uh, starting there. And um, you have to decide one of many factions or let's call them organizations with their own agenda. And depending on what kind of organization you pick, you kind of pick your play style of focus. So you want to, to focus around, there's like one faction who wants to leave Earth as fast as possible because they're like, oh, we're doomed. Aliens are coming. Earth is not uh, going to be in our hands anymore. Let's build as fast as possible spaceships that are sustainable and we can leave Earth and, I don't know, colonize Mars. And uh, the fun fact about it is it's what you do about this whole tool set that we give you because it's it's kind of like you set the narrative in terms of what faction you pick and then it's up to you it's like with uh, geopolitical resources with what country you're working with where you try to bring your influences there is randomness to your uh, agents that you play out because you play the game through your agents and uh, then also deciding if and who what agents you want to pick because their backgrounds might come in beneficial or might come in and bite your ass like i told before with the uh, one of the criminal background where the criminal organization is coming up and be like, hey, he's our guy and we want money or all kinds of random stuff happening. And all these factors and narrative lines directing your story, I don't know, it feels so empowering and, and interesting. And even if you play the same faction again, all the things that are happening are different. I mean, there is kind of a red line of course, like alien contact is happening and you're kind of under time pressure to decide which direction do you what you do and uh, it's, it's really good plays out really well and lots of fun excellent thank you for that yeah i appreciate that uh, and then yeah um lynn coming back to you you talked about the the luck mechanic in rivers of london and you know how that plays out you know we're drawing all these various strands together where do you feel you know rivers of london and call of cthulhu end up in that balance between the yeah the the control and the exposure to randomness for all the better term I think we've got a good balance. I think we've given the players lots of control, obviously because they get to choose what skill they use. They can push the role, they can spend luck. If you're a nice person and you let them have luck spending in Call of Cthulhu, because I know not every GM, do, not every keeper does because it's optional. Um, and I think we've managed to maintain that balance that the players feel like they have a lot of control but at the end of the day, there's still that element of randomness because let's say your skill in something is 70% and, you know, you roll, no, no, let's say your skill in something is 50% and you roll 80 and it's kind of a critical roll, but you've been a bit profligate with your luck throughout and there's no way you can push this thing and you don't have that 30 luck to spend to make your roll a success the dice have still bitten you. You know, that randomness has come in to decide the fate of whatever's happening in that particular moment. So yeah, I think we've done a really nice job of balancing it actually. And because I love luck. I think it's fantastic and great for helping tell stories and, and push the narratives in, in different ways. No, it's true. I, I think thinking back to my own experience, you know, running Call of Cthulhu games, the, the amount of times when we're chatting about it after all people are telling friends about it, that the, the role of the dice comes into it. It's like, you know, and then I tried to do this thing here and I only had, you know, there was a 5% chance it could happen, but it happened, you know, and, and that, like you say, the drama of the unlikely is very exciting. Yeah, um, I mean, that's it. I always <coughs> say to players, even if you've only got the base chance, go for it because you'll be surprised how many times you do roll under 5% yes. on your art craft whatever skill um you know and and you manage to pull off an absolute miracle and those are the moments that stay with people and as you say they're the ones that you share with your friends yeah uh absolutely and then Dan coming coming to you then yeah drawing these threads together how how, how where do you feel um tell us a little bit about how for the king kind of again takes these two themes we've talked about the exposure to randomness and the the control of randomness together into the, the final offering to the player sure i'll just um summarize for the king quickly at, from a top level so you know lots of dice four player adventuring in a classic world a fantasy world of goblins heroes magic and sword play um it's really your game if you like our rpgs dnd board games co-op adventures turn-based combat um then it's quite a stat heavy game um, 
but also a game that you could just really enjoy the story. So, you know, it really gels with any kind of gaming gang out there, particularly my friends. I've got some guys who just all that story, whereas myself, I really like the stats and the synergies and the combinations, min-maxing, etc. So to complete any action uh, in Feather King 2 generally requires the roll of a dice, um, whether that's kind of strolling down the, the friendly forest lane or picking some mushrooms or having an arm wrestle. Lots of random things happen all over the place. Um, and of course, fighting a dungeon full of uh, monsters. Um, dice rolls uh, play out quite seamlessly, um, but you know each character has a range of uh, strengths and weaknesses. So, you know, are they intelligent, speedy and lucky, or strong and slow but talented? Um, you know, these stats determine uh, the player's chance to succeed at a particular action uh, or dice roll. So you can generally like have that sense of control where you can pick your strongest adventurer to smash through the locked door. You know, what's the scenario if you want to dig, dig deep into it and, and ma uh, maximise your chances of success? Um, who's your most aware character to ambush that troll? You know, uh, and then, you know, difficulty is then defined by the number of dice rolls. So, you know, a crossbow, for example, might be it would require two successful dice rolls. Uh, where a longbow may require four. So damage is, uh, and success is then scaled uh, depending on the outcome. So, you know, hitting three out of four successful dice with your bow, you know, would be a pretty decent attack. Maybe no, no success type for dice rolls and it's a botch and you dropped your bow and it snapped. Um, you know, significantly there is, there is a control mechanic in there. Like I said, you know, we have a resource uh, in game that translates to your character's focus which is um, quite in context. You're concentrating on something. Uh, each character has focus points and you can spend them and then they can be replenished or gained, regained uh, throughout the adventure, like, you know, like Talisman style. Um, you know, spending a focus point will guarantee that single dice to be successful. This is quite, you know, it's really quite unique, a, a novel uh, and really entertaining. That's why, you know, really love this game. Um, because it adds that unique layer of strategy and tactics uh, and uh, control. So the player can choose to nudge the chance in their favour. Um, so generally for me, like uh, as a game player, you know, I want to be in the zone of like 83% roughly. Now that's my safe zone because that's the equivalent of one out of six. Yeah. So I tend to sort of nudge myself into that comfort zone, you know, but with some planning, you know, you can use this mechanic to like really, you know, save up all your points and pump the whole lot into a huge, massive, perfect longbow shot from 50 yards for a critical finish on that boss and a game winning move. And you're a hero straight away. Um, so it's, it's in, in, in your hands from, from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, um, just, you know, just want to make a comment like this, uh, this uh, player in the community called um, Sheldon. And uh, I heard, like, during uh, some of our alpha testing, that he refused to open a, a mimic, a, a chest. He refused to open a chest because he he must know that there's there's 25 percent chance of it being a mimic and attacking <laughs> him or and robbing all this stuff. Um, so as an advanced player, you know, I'm with him. You know, a 25 percent just is not a risk I want to take at the end of a dungeon sometimes. So. Well, actually, Ray's a really good question. We're going to go a quick shoot round. What everybody's thought on it is, how good do you think people are, from your experience, at understanding probability? Because, you know, like anecdotally in my own life, you know, we get the, the BBC weather forecast, you'll look at it and it'll go like, you know, there's a, there's a high chance of rain or there's a high chance of sun. And then you go outside and it's raining. And people are like, the weather said it would be sunny. It's like, well, no, it said it will probably be sunny. It didn't, it wasn't an absolute, like... You know, from your own experience, what, what do you find? I mean, Lynn, you said you're doing a lot on the convention circuit. How how good do you do you find people are understanding probability? Um, on the whole, not great. I mean, my background is also human genetics, where you know probabilities are are <laughs> fairly important, and you know it's it's the same in sort of like all these family tree will give you your DNA and tell you where your DNA is from. I mean, it's all probabilities. It's not actually telling you where any of this stuff is from. It's just the chance that it could be from there. It's most mm -hmm. likely to be from there. I know people, people struggle. I struggle with it sometimes, you know, um, which is why I get people like Paul Fricker to come and design game systems for me because I tend to design things by feel rather than probability because, you know, maths has never been my strong point. Um, so... <laughs> 
Um, yeah, people don't. People really do kind of struggle with that idea that just because you've got 85% in a skill does not mean to say that you are going to succeed 85% of the time. It's just your chance on any given go that that's what you got, you're going to succeed. So, yeah, no, probabilities are this weird mind bendy area of maths that just kind of, ooh, it's, ma it's technically magic, let's face it. <laughs> Yeah, and um, um, well, Patrick, what what would be the, the the mimic chest equivalent on Wildermyth where people are like, <laughs> don't go there, don't 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 click that button. Oh gosh, uh, in Wildermyth, I'm not sure. Um, I feel like we try not to have too many too many chances where it's the outcome would feel particularly bad. There are certainly ones where there is a better reward and a smaller chance, but then there's that excitement that kind of can often overcome the worrying about the negative outcome. Yeah. Um, I just want yeah. to, I'm, I'm thinking of, I'm curious what impact uh, games like specifically thinking of XCOM uh, where they're the probabilities that they show are not the true probabilities. I, I don't think this is the case for all XCOM games, but for at least one of them where it's like, Oh, if you, if it shows, like 95% or more, there's actually around a 100% chance of hitting. It's interesting thinking about that in terms of like, that is modeled after how players view the probabilities. It's like, all right, so if we show this probability, what does the player think it actually is? Hmm. Which probably isn't helpful for helping players understand what real probability feels like, but... Yeah, yeah. I don't know whether you had any thoughts on this, Cormac, about how... how you see players understanding the probabilities of the game. It's pretty harsh uh, that you can transcend a, a form of like understand it all. I think it's depends on the persona itself that is in front of it. And uh, talking of XCOM, this typical 99% chance you will hit, you stand point blank with your shotgun in his face and all of a sudden he's like aiming on the ground and shooting in the yeah. ground. It's hard. I don't think there is like a common, really easy way of sense of making it. It's, it's more of a, how can we make it fun to be interacted with uh, mm -hmm. more that approach instead of like understanding it? Because I don't think that we ourselves sometimes understand it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I can see that. Marlo, do you have a, a mimic equivalent in, in your games? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if a mimic equivalent comes to mind, but I do really feel like I get the sense that, you know, people who play our games, I think people in general have a really hard time with probability. I think as a survival instinct, we don't really need to understand probability to the degree that we have to do when we play these games. Like we kind of just go on vibes and it works. Um, and I think that a lot of people play that way. I probably play a lot of games that way myself. Uh, yeah, I just think it's really interesting. I think that at least coming from an art direction perspective too, something that you have to do, I think a lot of times, especially in video games to help people understand randomness is like, what icons do you use to show that randomness is happening? And I think that a lot, we borrow a lot of them from tabletop because people understand like, if I see a dice and a dice is rolling, something random mm. is happening. If I see a card being drawn, I know it's a random card from a deck. If I see slot machines, I'm playing Final Fantasy VII and it's limit break time. I know that something random is happening. And you know, it's sort of like that communication to the player at least helps them understand in theory that randomness is happening. But because again, as we've discussed, players don't actually see the underlying code behind the visual of that dice. It can feel very, you know, shady a lot of the times. So as designers and developers, we really have to kind of say, yes, randomness is real, but also understand that players are going to be going on vibes. And we kind of have mm. to like, you know, ride that line of there's randomness in the game, but it will still feel good to players. Uh, and it's a hard line to ride sometimes yeah no absolutely I, I think humans are very feel based as much as people like might like to think we're super logical we're really not um okay what's great well what i'm going to do is as we come towards the end of this uh is uh i created a little you'll see in the in the in the chat there which i'll read out now create a little quick fire round to ask everybody uh, a question or two 
Uh, and what I'd like to do as, as we're coming to the end is roll a dice, see which one comes up for you, uh, and then also give you an opportunity at the end of that if you could plug, you know, what, what you want to plug here so people watching the stream can go and check out a thing and, and see whether or not, uh, you know, uh, and I would heartily recommend, you know, because we obviously curated this stream, all of the stuff here that people are talking about is fantastic, but I'd like obviously give you a chance to kind of plug it yourselves. Um, so I'll I'll start with, with you this time, Lynn. Uh, and I, you just have to trust. I'm holding the dice up. You know, you just have to trust. I roll. I should have had <laughs> a proper I'm assistance. I'm glad you're not it. rolling her because this is the drama oh. queen. This is Big Red. She knows how to. She's she's not random. She controls stories by her temper tantrums. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know it's actually behind you. There's a massive D20. There is. Yes. Shh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but don't wait. You the can't dice. get plus I only tens, just noticed they'd be that. There too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. So I'm ro rolling for you then, Lynn. Uh, we got a three. So favorite game with dice in other than your own work? Oh, I'm going to have to say Talislanta. That's it. That is actually D20 based, so it's highly appropriate. Um, so because <laughs> Talislanta was the game that got me into really writing my own stuff and actually helped get me into the gaming industry. So I will always have a huge soft spot for Talislanta. Brilliant. And yeah, can you tell us uh, yeah, a little bit about you know, what, why should people go out uh, straight from here, click on the link uh, next to your profile, uh, go to Chaosium's website and get uh, Call of Cthulhu and or Rivers of London? Well, because they're awesome, obviously. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it hurts to say that being British. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, obviously, the latest one that's <clears throat> come out for me on the Cthulhu side is Regency Cthulhu, which is a huge amount of fun if you like your Jane Austen with a little bit of tentacles um so you know you can do your whole social niceties thing your balls and go deal with the mythos as well um and of course the big one for me uh, that came out um end of november beginning of december last year of course is rivers of london the role-playing game based on the series of urban fantasy novels by ben aronovich one of the reviews we've had of it was actually um described the system as brp elegant which i know made paul fricker very very happy um, so if you like your BRP-based games, your percentile-based games, um, go and check it out. It, you know, it's, it was designed to introduce new people to gaming using the BRP house system. Perfect. Right, Dan, coming to you now. Here we go, the big roll. Four. The best dice. Is it D4, D6, D8, D20, D12, or D20? Uh, sorry, D12 or D20, and why? Quite easy for me. Uh, it's a D6. Uh, because I am most familiar with those probabilities, so I think I was is that because it's more... in Blood Bowl? Yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a bit, bit obsessed with that game. But as as Marlo said, like working out probabilities on the fly in a game is really satisfying. But you know, um, I'm saying D6 here because I've got them all kind of pre-programmed. You know, I, I know I know what's uh, what's going to be good for me. Uh, my tournament over the weekend, I rolled. Double one, which is the worst thing you can do, seven times in a match. <laughs> uh, and I felt pretty sick. Uh, my opponent was so very sorry for me, but and I worked that out. It felt like it felt pretty much like fourteen ones in a row, and I worked out that's the equivalent of one in seventy-eight billion. Oof. Uh, so I bought a lottery yeah. ticket <laughs> and that night, but I also got a bit down about my dice and I filled my a bowl full of salty water if anyone wants to do this <laughs> get a bowl of salt water put loads of salt in it and you can really start to test your your dice you know you put you, you roll them in there and because there's no friction they kind of float up to where the dice might be okay. slightly that's, misbalanced that's yeah oh, I, I, I thought you were going to say remove the evil spirits yeah <laughs> I, <know>. I thought, <laughs> I thought that we were like primal. torturing the dice as punishment <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for a second yeah. I tried to feel myself rolling doing this to prove that there was something wrong with my dice, but there weren't. There wasn't. Okay, and a quick plug, quick plug for uh, for the king then, and for the king too. Sure. Yeah. So I yeah, I kind of I kind of um, covered that quickly previously, but um, yeah, for the king too, uh, released later this year, um, second game in the in the series, um, bringing loads more excitement, loads more new loads of new features. Um, 
four player, which is a big deal. I've got a strategic combat grid now, um, so there's loads more depth to the combat, a whole new re revitalized art style, um, bigger game, um, more adventures. Uh, it's like my dream genre, lots of dice, four players, uh, adventuring classic fantasy world, goblins, heroes, magic, sword play. RPG okay. game, D and D board games. It's just the perfect game to like, you know, sort of, yeah, you know, post D and D. Just hang out uh, with your friends and just sort of chill out in this game. Or you could use it to plan a whole day's worth or a whole evening's worth of adventuring. Really, uh, as challenging yeah. as you dare. Thank you, Dan. That's great. Okay, let's come to you then, Patrick. The dice are spoken. Uh, favorite book, film, or comic with randomness in number five. Oh man, uh, I tried to figure out my answer to each of these before, <laughs> right. yeah. before this, but couldn't think of anything good for this. Um, I honestly can't think of that much media that I've watched that has, well, okay, here's, here's one. I, I'm not sure how much this counts, but okay. uh, it counts if you want it to count. One one of my favorite films recently is Everything Everywhere All at Once. It is, ah, fantastic. It is a multiverse film, and it I don't know if I would call it randomness per se, but it does have uh, many different universes with many different strange things happening in it, and uh, a character who is able to travel through those universes, and I think the way it's done is very good uh and it does bring to mind some of other questions about randomness in general and yeah no i i think that's a great answer i think that's a fantastic answer. i'm just thinking yeah somebody playing call of Cthulhu, and they the, the, you know the, the gm asks what did you roll and you're like well i rolled all the numbers simultaneously so i got, I got every result you could have <laughs> i fumbled and i killed killed the body yeah um uh, yeah quick plug for wildermyth yeah, Wildermyth is a tactical strategy RPG, uh, character-driven, hero-based, very inspired by Dungeons and & Dragons and games like XCOM. Uh, play it if you want to read a lot. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of comics in it with a lot of text, but uh, if you want to have characters that are randomly generated who you learn to care about throughout the process of a campaign, and if you want fun tactical strategy that has uh percentage roles that are not skewed <laughs> good good to hear fantastic okay right turning to you then uh uh, uh yeah turning to you then call maker let's give you the role and see what we get you've got a three as well so let's favorite see. game other than your own uh with dyson well i will uh, grab wildermyth in that case because uh, I recently just played one of my campaigns, and it was phenomenal and heartbreaking. We cried on stream. We laughed on stream. It was a roller coaster of emotions. It was everything. It was like I watched a Disney movie, something like that. And uh, it's just it's just amazing. The, the whole com hey. concept of it, how it plays together, and the storytelling. Uh, I just quickly sum it up. We had a moment where the character had to decide to use the blessing to unstone another person that was trapped there in that cave for a long time or use it on himself to cure an incurable illness and uh, the character being one of the chat of people decided to give the cure to the person in the cave and then we kind of had to see the main character be great in health and die but then the other person was so joyful for, for being back alive and not stoned anymore it was so oh we tried <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, yeah, fantastic. And a quick plug for uh, yeah for Terry and Vitica and Hooded Horse Games, uh, which Hooded Horse are really knocking out of the park with some fantastic titles, I have to say. Thank you, thank you. We're working really, really hard. Um, so Terry and Victor, grand strategy game. If you liked uh, the grand work of uh, XCOM Long War, it's from uh, that mod team that made now they're working on Terry and Victor. Grand strategy, aliens on Earth. Lots of geopolitical things, storytelling going on, uh, turn-based, in a sense, turn-based uh, kind of RTS combat uh, against the aliens and many more. And we just, like, at the beginning, there's so much more coming. 
something on the Okay, and then last but certainly not least, let's turn to Marlo and six. The best result for the end one. Uh, right, does life feel random or predetermined? You've got you got like thirty seconds to, yeah, no. to answer the big philosophical to question people write, write novels about. Totally random. It's totally random. I don't know. I feel <laughs> like it is. I again, you have to be the little game designer in your old life, and you have to figure out how to mitigate that randomness. But it is random. That's what I'll say. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> Okay, and then, yeah, final plug for, for uh, Floppy Nights and um, Dicey Dungeons. Yeah, Floppy Nights uh, came out last year. It's a tactical deck building game. So if you like Fire Emblem and you like Advanced Wars and you also like deck builders, it's definitely one to check out. And then Dicey Dungeons is just that classic dice rolling roguelike. Uh, and yeah, you just, you know, descend into a dungeon, collect a lot of equipment, take dice and put it in different slots and battle enemies and... Yeah, I can't recommend them enough. If you like those types of games and you might like looking at my art, uh, definitely check them out. Brilliant. Well, thank you all so much for your time. And uh, everybody go and check out the links and you can see all the titles we've been talking about here. And we are, well, I should roll the dice, but whatever the outcome, we are finished on this panel. Thank you. <laughs>